All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with DJ Cook. It's July 9th, 2024, and we're at Stoller in Dayton. DJ, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first question to get things started is why wine? Uh, for me, more of grapes. Uh, always more of a kind of a plant nerd. Um, I knew I wanted to grow some plant. I didn't focus on grapes until uh, college. Um, originally started out thinking I was going to be in ornamental nursery production. That was during the housing crisis and people buying uh, less houses, planting less yards, and so that industry was crashing. Uh, I have some family in farming. Um, and so I was at Oregon State and was still taking soil classes. And I went on a field trip with my soils science professor, uh, James Cassidy. And we went out to a vineyard near Corvallis and did a pruning workshop and uh, became interested in it. And then I started working with Patty Skinkis on some research projects uh, to assist her and her grad students. And that's when I became more and more interested in it. Um, you know, it, it, uh, there wasn't an aha moment of like, yes, grapes, wine, but it was just, I knew I liked growing plants <clears throat> um, and just kind of wanted to dig deeper into it. Uh, and then, you know, working with Patty and her students that connected me with other employers uh, after Oregon State, I majored in horticulture, Oregon State, with the focus in business. Um, or a minor in business with a focus in viticulture. And she connected me with her grad students who worked for Gallo previously, got an internship with Gallo in Sonoma as a viticulture research intern. Loved it in Sonoma, obviously, who wouldn't? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but was able to, I, working for a company as big as Gallo and as many possibilities and how open they are to research and new ideas and development, um, pretty fun to work for them. Uh, but knew I wanted to be back in Oregon uh, for friends and family and because Oregon is amazing, weather-wise, climate. Uh, and so I came back to finish uh, my degree at Oregon State. And then Patty connected me with uh, Tim Scott. And Tim Scott was uh, then the vineyard manager at Archery Summit. Uh, set up an internship with Tim, and then worked a vintage in the, <clears throat> in the vineyard, a vintage in the winery, and then they hired me on full time. So I was there for four years, which was a great experience. Going from Gallo, huge production. I don't know the exact number of cases, but it's a lot, <laughs> obviously. And then going to Archery Summit of a ten to fourteen thousand case, uh, ultra premium quality. Um, learned so many things. Tim was a great teacher for me. Uh, but then after four years, I was ready to continue learning and do a little traveling. Uh, so I was then worked with some friends. They connected me with a, uh, a winery in New Zealand called Craggy Range. And I was Craggy Range premium Pinot Noir region uh, is down in the Wairapa Valley. And so I was down in Martinboro, worked down there for six months uh, during the winter of Oregon. So hit the back to back to back summers of Oregon, New Zealand, Oregon. It was wonderful. <laughs> Talk about vacations. <laughs> um, worked down there, but it was great to see the uh, similarities and differences of Pinot Noir regions across the world. Uh, and, and just the New Zealand culture. Uh, then came back, had a little off time, and then that's when I linked up with uh, Erica Miller, who was here, and uh, started working for Stoller as a bit tech. And then when Erica left, then uh, I uh, climbed to the viticulturist position, and uh, that's, that's where I'm at now, and just continuing to try to master the craft, which is, you know, there's no end to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I continually, I'm, I'm in it for, because my interest in plants, in vines, in uh, the ever-changing factors of grape growing, whether that's 
weather conditions, climate conditions, uh, previous years, history of the vine's health, and how you can adapt to that, and along with working with Patty and other researchers to develop new techniques all along the way. Tell us a bit about life before all that. Where were you born and raised, and what, what, was, your, what was your sort of path to Oregon State? Uh, born and raised in Clackamas, Clackamas, Oregon. Uh, parents were educators in Portland. Uh, my brother went to Linfield, and he is now an educator. Um, and so I was kind of the black sheep. I, I, my immediate family was not farmers, um, but I have some cousins yeah, in St. Paul, Central Oregon, that are farmers. Um, but I was a black sheep that knew they were into plants, and so I followed the path. I always knew I was going to go to Oregon State. I was always going to be a beaver. <laughs> go beeves. <laughs> um, and uh, so then Oregon State, uh, horticulture degree, because I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but met a lot of interesting people, you know, had a bunch of different pathways in plants to follow, uh, and was lucky enough to find grapevines. How do grapevines compare to other plants? What, what did you have to learn? What, what, I guess what was special about them compared to other things you had learned? Um, I mean, when you think about it, they are so similar to other other plants because you're always shooting for quality, whether that's like an ornamental plant, it has to look nice to, to the buyer. Uh, grapes, it has, has to look nice, but also has to taste nice, right? <laughs> um, so the attention to detail in the fine tuning of growing vines and grapes and, and different applications of either a management technique by labor or a management technique by a certain fertilizer or, or some other modification like that can greatly change or enhance the, the final quality of the fruit. But then also with grapevines, it's you're working with so many different parties. You're working with the winemakers, the grower reps, um, you're working with the public. Um, and so there's a little bit more widespread attention, I guess, uh, in many different departments that you're working with. That being said, I've never truly had a position in a ornamental nursery. <laughs> I've just watched my cousin. But um, uh, yeah, just the attention to detail uh, is that's the, the main goal, right, is to produce the highest quality wine. So tell me a little bit about your work, work with Patty while you're still in school and while you're sort of discovering grapevines. What appealed to you about the work and what were some of the kind of the first big learning moments for you? I, I would say I gained so much from her uh, grapevine, her, her classes at Oregon State. Uh, the work in her lab made it more so like, I'm like, well, maybe I'm not cut out for research or you know the monotonous counting of berries or the cluster counting or the weights and and I can figure a little bit into that uh, to, to my future work but um, I think it was her class that kind of led me down this path and because you kind of followed the progression of a year in the vineyard um, and along with she has this well-known project in her class of the uh, you select your own vineyard and you carry this whole project through and by then it's a portfolio, a vineyard portfolio from start to finish of purchasing a vineyard temperature. Have you heard about that? Okay. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Yeah, and it was very, very difficult, but it was well worth it, learned so much, and I think that really led to me wanting to know more about vineyards and grapevines. Um, Patty then had multiple graduate students who I would help in the lab or would, I remember I came out to Stoller actually for some projects with their trunk disease trial or cultivation trial. Um, and I, we went to other vineyards to help out and to Woodhall. Um, but so it was great and it's great to maintain that relationship with Patty because I can always call her, email her, um, and she's always lending a helping hand. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned kind of the year in the vineyard. Tell me a little bit about getting to under, getting to know the year in the vineyard. What's what is sort of what are sort of the the most important points in the vineyard year for you to pay attention to? 
Uh, springtime, I would say, is our is our mini harvest in the vineyard is what we call it sometimes uh, because you have so much moisture in the soil um, while the weather is getting nicer, warmer temperatures, so everything's growing at the same time. And that's cover crop, weeds, vines, pest disease, uh, and that's when you need most of your labor. Um, so there, there's, you know, uh, peaks and valleys, right? The springtime, it, it really intensifies. And then after you get kind of hold on the canopy, then it kind of levels off a little bit until harvest. Then you go up again and with many peaks and valleys within that. Um, but I think I learned, I learned a lot of that from Tim Scott at Archery uh, because I remember coming from Patty's class and being like, hey, you know, I studied this. I know grapes and everything. He's like, oh, man, here we go. You, we'll put you through it. Okay. And, but, and to really pay attention to, you know, you have your workload is huge. Um, you're never going to get it all done in one day. You have to pace it out. But then it's all, also always about the people. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to work with the people, uh, whether that's operators or your management team or hand crews or suppliers, um, that when you're in times of need, they can be a huge aid. So <clears throat> I think Tim was huge in that and helping me discover like the bigger picture of grapevine growing where it is a huge task. You get in these, these peaks of, of intense work, but there's a lot of people to help support you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your, your, the Gallo internship you mentioned, obviously uh, a, a massive, a massive place. So tell me a little bit about um, your piece of that and what were the sort of the biggest takeaways from that for you? Uh, at Gallo, so they have ongoing research projects. Um, I obviously can't dive into any of those. Uh, I signed a couple papers <laughs> saying I wouldn't say, but they have ongoing research projects. Um, and then each intern has their own research project that you design. Um, and then you carry out the research project and then you present on it at the end of the year to uh, their vineyard managers and vit techs. Um, so it gave me a lot of experience in a more specific field because it wasn't as much vineyard production. Um, they are different departments, research and production. Um, but the amount of resources they have and they're willing to, to invest in people is very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but just getting a, a general overview of Gallo, like just seeing how the company works and how Harvest works and how uh, kind of the tier system of how they operate their vineyards uh, was very beneficial, even at an early, earlier, earlier age in the vineyard industry, uh, just kind of getting a taste of it was uh, pretty special. Because, you know, you kind of reflect back on that, too. Like, man, if I knew what I knew now back then, like, how would have I, would I have been able to build on that or, or, or take more from it or whatnot? But, uh, yeah, it is kind of fun to reflect back to that. So you came back to Oregon, came back to Archery Summit uh, eventually. Tell me, tell me about um, sort of initial role at Archery Summit. What were... What were you hired to do, and what was sort of your first, I guess, first impressions or first steps in the in the job? Uh, I believe so. I, I came on to Archery as a vineyard intern, um, smaller company, a uh, hundred maximum a hundred acres of planted vines, um, and then we removed some, you know, throughout the five years, four or five years I was there. Uh, so having vineyard manager, four tractor drivers, one foreman, and then there's me. So my my title after being vineyard intern was, I think I was tractor driver slash mechanic, which is kind of where you got to start out. <laughs> so um, I didn't do much tractor driving or, uh, you know, I learned a little bit of the mechanics, but, uh, but I was there to uh, monitor crews, to be a support to tractor drivers when they had uh, difficulties, but kind of being a watchful eye over everything and then in charge of uh, lag weights and, uh, safety and pest and disease monitoring. Um, so it, it was uh, a great 
because that company was smaller in comparison to Gallo or even in comparison to Stoller now, uh, it was fun to see the other side of things, how, how a smaller company can work um, and the interactions between that. And, and uh, the archery team is a small family. You know, when you get into those smaller companies, as I'm, you've had plenty of them that you've interviewed, uh, the, the dynamics between the personnel in that company is, it, it's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the vineyards there and about your sort of your role and your path in getting to know them. Uh, let's see. Uh, had, uh, vineyards in Dundee Hills, Arcus is very well known, Red Hills, very well known. Um, the vineyards, the Renegade, Archer's Edge, Archery Summit Estate, um, all in Dundee Hills. Vigorous, but I mean, the soils are amazing there. Um, and then there was Looney over in Ribbon Ridge, which was leased. Uh, huge comparison between Ribbon Ridge soils and Dundee Hill soils. Uh, I would say Ribbon Ridge had, we had to pay attention to it a lot more for nutritional needs, uh, irrigation needs, um, where Dundee Hills is kind of its own beast. <laughs> it has everything it needs. You just have to, it's all about like how you, how, you know, the architecture of the grapevine and how you're going to manage that. Um, loved all of, working with all of those vineyards. And then the clones that, uh, the suitcase clones that were over there, Gary Andrews brought over. Um, we talk about the uh, 828 that he brought over that is very upright growing and which any grape farmer would love to grow because it grows straight up and there doesn't flop at all. And we had that at Red Hills uh, Vineyard, which is amazing to manage. Um, and then the, each site has its own, you know, they have the Caracol at Red Hills, which is the circular block of Pinot Gris over there. I don't know if you've seen that one. <coughs> Um, but sites were great, fun to manage at the time, um, but all very distinct, mm -hmm. all very distinct. So with that distinctiveness, what, how do you, I guess, how do you learn what to look for and how do you sort of keep track of the different needs of, of the different sites? They all have their own needs, right? They, it, it's about like being in the vineyard and constantly checking on them. I know like Renegade uh, with the, the slope and the aspect, the way it was, you know, it needed constant monitoring of like, okay, you know, does this need cultivation? Does this need more water? So it's about just like being there, I guess, and, and constant monitoring. Um, it's always difficult to devote that much time to be in each block uh, across, you know, five different vineyards at that time. And, and then here, a lot more acres with a lot more different sections. Um, but it's about the devotion of being, always having watchful eyes, whether that's your eyes or somebody else's eyes to do check-ins with everything, um, but not to leave something unwatched, untouched, um, continuing to, to just monitor, continuous monitoring. How did your role at Archery Summit evolve over the years you were there? <laughs> Eventually I made it out of being the tractor driver slash mechanic. <laughs> um, I think, but really it was more, more trust um, that coworkers, um, whether that be in the tasting room or in marketing or tractor drivers or supervisors and, and Tim uh, did have more trust in me and knowing the lay of the land and knowing how the crews work and knowing the next steps and, and knowing how to lead a crew through the vineyard and what I should do next. And he was very thoughtful to that and saying, okay, like now that you've seen it done, now how would you guide this crew through and what would you do and what would you do if it was a hot day, a hundred and some degrees, like what's your cutoff or, you know, and, and again, having the utmost thought for the people you're working with. Uh, so I would, I would say 
you know, along the way, built trust, uh, continual education, learning more, able to make uh, some some better decisions and better timing. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, it's just more responsibility. So you talked about the the kind of the, the detour to New Zealand at that point, and your in your your three summers in a row, which does sound really nice. I have to say, uh, tell me about New Zealand, and you mentioned sort of the the the, the, the similarities and differences, the comparing and contrasting. Um, what was new there for you when you got to New Zealand? A lot of it is very similar to to growing Pinot and Chard in Oregon. Uh, as far as the culture, a lot more laid back. I'd say, I mean, it's every part of life in New Zealand, I would say, is a lot more low-key, laid back, whether that's the work culture or just just the outings. Um, granted, I was in a very small town in Martinborough, um, but I remember one story over there was I there is an adjustment to learning the, the accent over there. So the first couple of weeks, I had a very difficult time picking up what they were saying because it's such a strong accent. So going over there, week two on the job, everybody was at work before me. And I was like, what happened? Did I miss the time? He's like, ah, oh, mate, you wouldn't have understood us anyway. So we just didn't invite you to the safety meeting. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, well, OK. <laughs> so safety may have been a little bit more low key over there. But, uh, but just, I guess, they, they adjust to, they're very flexible there with, with personnel, um, with just going with the flow. Um, and that's, I think, in great management, too, to an extent. Uh, if something needs to be pushed off, if uh, hedging needs to be pushed off, if some management needs to be pushed off a day or two, it's like, OK, we'll adjust to it. Yeah, a actual differences in, in grape growing, I mean, specifics, a little more irrigation over there. Um, but it, it is pretty similar to here. The wines are amazing, just like here. Uh, they grow Sauvignon Blanc down there, which is very nice. But I, th I think for me, it was just more of the, the culture of just everything's, I guess for us, I consider it beach time for us. So beach time for us is like, oh, we'll get there, we'll do that. New Zealand's all on beach time. It's <laughs> a really good way to describe it. Okay, that. does that make sense or was that just my family? I love that. Um, so uh, coming out of that experience, uh, I guess, what were you looking for next? What were you thinking of as a plan or a goal for yourself? What did you want to do in the wine industry? Good question. I knew I wanted to get back into grapes. Um, I knew I wanted to have a little break because I said, hey, I, have, I got back in May. And I was like, well, if there, if there's one summer to have off. It's probably this summer because then I'll you know, be in farming um, other summers. So I kind of took my time looking for jobs and making sure it's the right fit. Uh, but knew that I wanted more of the viticulture side of, of grape growing rather than the 100% production side. Um, I do love working with people, but I also like a mixture of working with people and the numbers side. I'm not saying I like to count berries of clusters for weeks at a time, but <laughs> there is a, there's a happy medium in there. And so that's, I met with a couple people, met with Erica, um, Erica and Jason and Dave at the time, and uh, they presented this position that they're looking for, and it was kind of up my alley of what I was looking for, and there's uh, room to progress in that position. Um, Stoller is always has so much opportunity uh, with moving up in the company or diversifying your position. Um, so I eventually found it and then said, yeah, I'm in. Uh, <clears throat> I think I continue to think that right now, that I do love the mix of the viticulture aspect and then mixed with some production because with our roles, with Chris and Jason and I, we, we do intertwine a little bit with duties. <clears throat> uh, you know, there's no problem for me to go out to the cruise, and I should be monitoring the cruise, checking in with them. Um, but then I also have a bunch of 
uh, tracking, whether that's like pest, disease, and all my viticulture uh, work that happens behind the scenes more so and with my small viticulture team. Yes, I'm curious about that. Tell me what a viticulturist does that I guess is different than a vineyard manager. What is, what is, the, what is sort of the heart of the job? For us, we have it broken into where vineyard manager, so Chris Lake, he is more of personnel. So he's on day-to-day -day, uh, work orders of working with the crew, assigning crew members certain tasks uh, with contractors, same deal, day-to-day uh, -day operations, making sure that work orders are followed through with. My part of that position would be to create the work orders and to identify what needs to be done, whether that's tractor work or um, farm labor contractor work, um, and pest and disease management, creating spray plans, uh, cultivation plans, estimations, um, and then have it working with winemakers also to have that connection. But we all try to be a part of that process, but mine is more of thinking the weeks to months ahead while still doing the day-to-day -day monitoring, just making sure that my plans are going through where Chris and Foreman's job is to uh, do the day-to-day, -day, just mm -hmm. to ensure that everything is, is done as it should be. But so, so my, my thinking, I'm always thinking, you know, not just next week, but then three weeks down and then like, you know, pretty much to harvest and then with also development, then I'm thinking two to three years down the road so that we can have the correct plants in the correct location and the correct soil samples and, and everything, everything that's needed for our progression in the vineyard. So how, tell me about getting to know this place versus other places you had been, um, getting a handle on the vineyard here and how, how it's different. You know, I thought Archery Summit was a, a vigorous site, but I think Stoller is even more vigorous. Um, I think it's Stoller Family Estate Vineyard is vigorous and it is has warm sections. Um, <clears throat> we often see bloom here or phen phenology stages a little bit earlier than most people in the valley, even most Dundee Hills sites. Um, so it's, it's this constant evaluation of different sections to make sure your nutrition is kind of on track and that your, your watering is on track, not too much, not too little, but kind of containing the beast so that your quality is at the top. Um, I think, you know, Shehala Mountains for, for Shehala Winery, Shehala Mountains, and is kind of middle ground of like, it's less of containing the beast. Uh, it is a little bit more self-moderating, uh, wonderful soils to where it's fertile on the top, top section and then it gets to more clay on the bottom. Um, and then on the opposite side is Ribbon Ridge where uh, you kind of, you need to feed those soils a little bit, whether that's compost or irrigation. Um, so. I think you have the range, um, an interesting range, but fun viticulture wise, kind of fun to work with to where, okay, we need to stress these vines out, but where in Ribbon Ridge, it's, you need to feed them a little bit. So, but again, it's just the constant monitoring. Like, yeah, I have to be in the vineyard. My team has to be out in the vineyard just to try to stay a little bit ahead of what's happening on the 100 degree days. <laughs> what are the biggest challenges, uh, I guess from a, from a, from a, I guess from a day to day? Uh, are you looking at uh, is, is, is pest challenges, weather challenges, what are the biggest challenges as you see? And what are the biggest things you're trying to stay ahead of? Um, challenges, I think there's always gonna be a challenge for labor. Um, and a challenge for um, quality labor or experienced labor to, for the great tractor drivers as, as, as we're trying to use more tools in the vineyard 
at higher efficiencies, the tractors get a little bit more complicated. And so having the intelligence to operate those large machines that are very detailed, um, I am very thankful that my assistant, Jose Cruz, is well-versed well in, in calibrations of our new sprayers and our new uh, our Polonk over the row tractor. Um, he does very well with that and he does very well training uh, some of our operators that are able to do that. Um, so I think labor is one challenge we will always face. I think weather and mother nature is always going to be, like, there's no end in that. You know, the skies are getting a little smokier today, um, but there's not a lot we can do about that. Um, we, we try to adjust as much as possible. We try to, you know, irrigation here, irrigation there to, avoid any any damage um, but you kind of have to go with the flow on those there's and not worry about it as much do as much as you can but at the end of the day sometimes there's not a lot you can do mm -hmm. um, it is a changing climate uh, and it's a warming climate um, and then i guess more of your your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week, uh, challenges might be more of your pest control uh, we are especially around July 4th weekend, we're always on the watch for uh, powdery mildew. Um, and then any other, any other pests that are coming into the area um, that we might have to deal with in years to come. Um, but there is a, a saying, at least for us, we always watch for July 4th, you will have powdery mildew somewhere in the vineyard. So find where it is and try to knock it out now so you don't have to deal with it later at a more severe, severe rate. So. When it comes to pest and disease pressures like that, how how do you stay? I guess stay up to date on what what you're looking for and when, um, and like because I, I, it feels like kind of feels like from the outside that there's something new every year that is coming into the Wyoming Valley to, to try to make your job hard. So how do you stay up to date with what the challenges are and, and how to find it? Uh, I think our Willamette Valley vet groups are very good at highlighting the biggest challenges we have. Um, so small a group of growers in the Willamette Valley get together um, once a month or so, um, depending on the time of year, uh, led by Patty and uh, Ken Kupperman. And uh, we just highlight what each of the growers is going through and then have a couple topics, new topics at uh, each meeting. But it is nice to have that back and forth with other growers. Um, and then just seeing, you know, fellow, fellow growers on my way up to, to Ribbon Ridge, uh, Nick Giannopoulos is up there and I said, Nick, what are you, what are you dealing with? He says, oh, got this, got this. But uh, so, I mean, it's the constant communication with growers in a more formal setting of a vid tech meeting or in a more uh, just day-to-day -day calling, calling others. But uh, it is nice that it is on a more casual basis. It is a pretty open industry, um, maybe not so much in a formal setting as a fit tech group or something that, you know, somebody can quote you, <laughs> but uh, like this, <laughs> um, but people are very willing to, to lend advice or if they see a problem in the vineyard, uh, they'll let you know because our, our vineyards are very close to each other. So if, if somebody has it, it is likely that your neighbor has it too. Mm -hmm. So you talked earlier about how your job was sort of short and medium and long term all, all together. Tell me about, especially on the long term, as you're looking years down the road, what are the things that you are uh, you're doing now to kind of to, to protect your future or to help your future plan? What are you looking for now, and what are your what are your what are the kind of the warning signs or the things you want to get uh, accomplished? At Stoller, we're always developing. Like we're always planting more um, for the past three years. We planted 30 plus acres each year. Uh, but we want to do that in, in an intelligent way for future years. So whether that means larger headland space so tractors can, can operate a little bit more efficiently, um, whether that's you know, irrigation as we have a warming climate you know, we will need water, especially for young vines. If they don't need it now, then there's a good chance they will need it later as, as summers get warmer. 
Um, so making sure we have that infrastructure in place so that we have a successful vineyard in 30 plus years down the road so that the quality fruit continues to come in. Um, as far as design, vineyard design, uh, I would also say in plant material. Um, we're always focused on getting clean ma plant material, strong vines, and then good connections with nurseries. Mm -hmm. So developing those relationships with nurseries and with other suppliers so that we continue to have um, intelligence in, in the equipment that we're, that we're operating and uh, in a long-term relationship with those individuals. And then with our personnel at Stoller, um, investing in them. You know, it, it, it's as much managing, but more so like teaching um, to continue their, their knowledge and growth within the company so that they're invested, so that they feel appreciated. Um, and that's how quality fruit's made. <laughs> mm -hmm. On the vineyard design side specifically, um, how are things changing? And is, is, is the climate playing a factor in your long-term decisions? I would say yes, climate is, is making a difference. Um, we try to make sure we have water rights anywhere we are planting. Um, the, the time it takes to develop a vineyard to, to reach the point where you're harvesting fruit on a section that's irrigated versus non-irrigated is, is a drastic difference. Yeah, and then, I mean, with, with water, I think that's our main, main struggle, um, is more mechanization um, to sections that are not reserved here. Um, we, we want to be able to reduce the amount of hand labor in a vineyard um, as costs continue to rise. Uh, our, our attention to reserve tier will always be the most important and, and there are certain things that we will always need hand labor for, but if we can pass off some mechanization in place of hand labor, then we try to do that. Um, sometimes it's paired with mechanization and hand labor. So um, when we're doing brush pulling in the winter, we have uh, purchased a pre-pruner that will prune off the top half to a third of the brush so that it's easier for our crews to go through and pull the brush. So trying to minimize the amount of time that they're in. Um, I, I think it's it's totally necessary for for what we're dealing with now with, with higher prices and, mm -hmm. and then more acreage, <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So what are you looking ahead to then, uh, personally or professionally, what, what comes next? What have you not done yet that you wanna do? I think I would like to, uh, I wanna just focus on mastering what I'm, what I'm doing right now. There's a lot of individuals in the industry that know far more than me <laughs> um, uh, I have a lot of experience and I would like to someday be one of those individuals where people look up to and say, hey, if I need to ask a question, I'm gonna go to them, you know, the, the Lee or the Tim Scott or the Dai, um, Ken. Um, so yeah, I would like to continue mastering Viticulture, whether that's you know viticulture and in that specific lane or production style too, or or development of vineyards, um, continue learning, and so to try to be somebody that that others can can lean on when they're getting into trouble. Talk about the, the industry a little bit at a kind of a larger scale. Um, what do you? What have you seen in Oregon wine? What? How has it grown and evolved since you've you've sort of been in it? And what does the industry look like now in in twenty twenty four? I think it's grown definitely uh, with growers. Um, I think there is there are a lot more younger younger growers out there also that are in the same position I am where. 
they get to certain points of the year and they're like, I don't know, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, ah. But that there is that constant communication um, and then being able to rely on people with a lot of experience is key and so supportive and helpful. Um, other than that, I just, it, it just continues to grow. I guess the, the Vit Tech meetings used to be a lot smaller. Um, I don't know if you've been to any of them, um, but, and I think people are a little bit more open than they used to be um, because we have more challenges or what today seems like more challenges than we used to have to deal with. Uh, so it's gonna take a lot more of an effort to, to come up with plans um, to be able to be on the upper hand of those. On that note, what does come next? What are what does the future look like? I guess on the on the especially on the growing side, uh, what is what's next for Oregon wine? Maintaining quality, I think. Adjusting, it'll be interesting to see how the wines adjust uh, as the climate warms. I think with more and more warmer summers. Um, or, you know, frosts or unexpected weather events, whether that's a late frost or an early frost or uh, rains. Um, I th but that's kind of why I got into the industry, right? Because I, I like the changing aspects and the mul many different factors of the growing season. Um, but I think this, we've been going on this trend for many years of a warmer year. Um, and It'll be interesting to see how the wines change from there. Right, last question for you. Uh, biggest accomplishment or the thing you're most proud, proudest of so far? I would say our vineyard, uh, Shehalem Estate Vineyard up on Bell Road. Uh, since I've been here, we probably planted 60 plus acres. Um, up there and I'm really looking forward to that fruit. Um, it is a beautiful vineyard on top of a hill with a beautiful view of Mount Hood uh, to the east and it, it at the beginning you couldn't really see what was planned for that vineyard. Um, it, it was hard to imagine, let's just say that. It was hard to imagine but now everything's kind of coming together uh, from multiple years of development, um, and I'm just excited for that fruit. It's, it's been a long time planned uh, with multiple changes, but <laughs> we are, it is looking good right now, and so just excited to see that in full production uh, and the kind of quality of fruit we can get from there. There's many different clones of Pinot, some Chardonnay, um, and so I'm excited for that. All right. All the questions that I have for you. Uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have or anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? I don't think so. All right. No. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Taking the time, sharing your story yeah. with us. Go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you.